I'm Claire Chiapetta, and this is the Cactex Media Podcast. Today's guest is Commander Tim Hicks of the Midlothian, Texas Police Department, and he will be sharing behind-the-scenes details of a See Something, Say Something campaign he helped develop. His department, along with officers and emergency management teams around DFW, work together to stay prepared for domestic terrorism. But it really requires all of us to keep North Texas safe. Let's dive in. Welcome, Tim Hicks. It's so great to have you here today to speak with you. Tim, tell me a little bit about your role here in Midlothian. Yes, definitely. Uh, First of all, thanks for having me. Excited to be here and speaking to you as well. So I'm a uh, police commander with Midlothian Police Department, and I supervise the school resource officers. We have a sergeant and eight other officers in the school, so we have a great partnership between the city and school district. And I'm also uh, the director of safety and security for Midlothian ISD. Tim, tell me about the city of Midlothian. What do you want people to know about your fair city? Well, of course, I do think it's a great city. Um, We are located about 25 miles southwest of downtown Dallas, really right in the middle of the Metroplex, easily accessible to Dallas, to Arlington, even to Fort Worth. But what we're seeing a lot right now in Midlothian that a lot of cities are probably seeing is growth. Probably 10 years ago or so, 18,000 maybe was our population. We're looking at right around 38,000 population right now, and we're going to continue to grow. I project, just me personally, we're going to hit you know, 48 to 50,000 in the near future because there are so many um, new houses, new neighborhoods going in, just new construction. We're over 60 square miles, and a lot of people don't realize that about Midlothian. There is um, a lot of industry here, concrete plants. We have a Google plant here, and so a lot of great things going on in Midlothian. But one of the things that's really great about this community is as we've grown, people seem to stay really tight-knit and neighborly. That just makes it a great community to live in when everybody still seems friendly and wants to know their neighbor and you know wants to be involved in the community. Is there a large population? I mean, we're, we're in this post-pandemic period where people are working from home, but are, do a lot of the population commute into Dallas or is that not true? It sounds like you do have a lot of industry to support the population. We do, but I, I think a, a pretty good portion probably still commute into Dallas or Orleans or even Fort Worth. Again, we have a lot that's here and a lot more coming. So the day we'll be here where hopefully a lot of our community members can work really in and around Midlothian and not have to have that commute. Because right now we all see gas prices, so uh, it's, it's not a great thing if you're having to drive very far. We're talking to you today because we're interested in your work on the See Something, Say Something campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that and what Midlothian in particular is doing with the campaign? Yes, definitely. So I was actually on an email thread with North Central Texas Council of Governments about some other training. And then this came up and they were asking for volunteers that may be interested in assisting with this campaign, with the See Something, Say Something video. And um, I was definitely interested because, again, being the commander of of school officers and always working around kids and being, you know, highly concerned of safety and security of of the students and staff here, I thought that sounds like a great idea to get awareness out there. So I responded back and said I would definitely be interested in helping out. And there was several people that were involved in this, um, so a great team effort. But I was able to talk to our superintendent of schools and offer up our baseball complex to be able to do some of the filming over there, um, as well as get some high school kids involved to be in the video as the audience and just you know, acting like they're at the game. And then we also moved to a city park, and we wanted some younger kids involved in that part of the shooting. So I was able to get some of our elementary kids involved as well and a few teachers to be in the background for that. They were all happy to do it. Of course, the older kids were excited about getting out of school, but getting to do something. They were our our drama and media kids, so accustomed to acting and having a good time. So they did great. Yeah, we partnered with you on a PSA around See Something, Say Something and domestic terrorism. And I think the, the question to you would be, you know, we all live our lives in these communities around the country and you don't think about domestic terrorism certainly every day. We don't, but I think you do. I would say to you first, what is domestic terrorism? When you're thinking about it, what's in your head? Domestic terrorism is essentially just any kind of violent criminal act by an individual or a group of individuals against people in their own country. Reasons for that, their motivation is usually trying to further their own ideology. Uh, It can be political, religious, social, or, or racial. Definitely an issue that we're seeing more and more, certainly in the last 20 years. And unfortunately, it's something that we saw just yesterday as well in New York. 
I'm sure you're privy to information that the general public is not. I would assume you would hear about things, whether you're in your role or even from other people who do know about it. Does it keep you up at night at this point? I mean, are there situations that you worry about on a day-to-day basis, or are you at the point in your career where you're used to it and you deal with it? Yes, I think to a certain extent, unfortunately, we're used to hearing about it. But at the same time, we don't get relaxed and we're we're definitely aren't jaded to the extent that it doesn't bother us anymore. Certainly, I I do think about it a lot because of my role. I'm constantly thinking about safety and security in our schools. And when you look at active shooter incidents, that's definitely a form of domestic terrorism. And so that is on my mind a lot. I'm an active shooter instructor for law enforcement, also teach civilians um, what to do and how to respond and how to act if they're ever caught really in any kind of violent type incident that's life-threatening. So I do think about it a lot. Um, but at the same time, just like we want to teach civilians not to be paranoid about this stuff, just to be aware, we're also not paranoid about it or don't try not to let it consume our lives. Definitely uh, when, when you're away from the job, have other hobbies and think about other things. But uh, unfortunately, because of the climate that we're in in this, in this country, I do think about it, it definitely on a weekly basis, if not daily. Today, we're in the sleepy town of Midlothian, which is a compliment these days, right, to be able to say a sleepy town, and certainly far away from what happened yesterday in New York City in the subway. I'm curious, as I look at that, you know, as a citizen and read about it and want to know everything I can, do you feel like you look at it as a law enforcement officer and want to know things, I don't know, specifics, facts about it that might be different than how I would look at it? A lot of times we will get emails from either uh, the Dallas Fusion Center or sometimes Department of Homeland Security that will give us a little bit more details about incidents after they've completed their investigation. And certainly I do want to know every time that there is some kind of domestic terrorism, uh, take yesterday an active shooter, I want to know the details to see how can we continue to be proactive? Why did that individual decide to do that? What was their motive? You know, were there any signs that that they discovered in their investigation through social media or through them talking to other people? And so you're always looking to see what was their specific situation? Was it a mental health issue? Which we could get into that and have a long conversation about that because there are so many mental health challenges that need to be addressed with, uh, with so many people out there today. So just knowing the why behind it helps us continue to be proactive and helps us think of different strategies and tactics to make sure that, it, or do our best at least to ensure that it doesn't happen in our city. Why does an initiative like See Something, Say Something, which is encouraging all of us to be aware, encouraging all of us to speak up and you know say something when we see something, right? Why is that so important? And do you have facts that back up that it is citizens really that have stopped a lot of things from happening? Yes, I, I can guarantee you. I, I don't know the statistics off, off the top of my head, but citizens have been involved and do give tips. But there's still a lot of people out there that just because we're in Midlothian, there's so many towns and cities across America that are our size or smaller or just a little bit bigger. It's where they really haven't had any issues of violence, of mass violence. And so I think the See Something, Say Something initiative just reminds people, do not think it can't happen where you live. If you do see something suspicious, don't just write it off as maybe that's not something you're thinking it was. We have this this normalcy bias in our minds that we want to we want to think that everything's normal. We want to think that it's not going to happen to us. Um, for example, when you ask victims or witnesses to an active shooter incident, and you ask them what did it sound like, what did you initially think it was before you realized that you were in an incident where your life is threatened and you could die, and so many times their answer is, "I thought it was fireworks." Then you think about, well, fireworks in the mall or fireworks outside of your school building or outside of your church. And I go back to Sutherland Springs, Texas, you know, horrible shooting back in 2017, killed 26 people, wounded 22 others in the small town of a population of somewhere between six and 700 people. And so when you start to think it can't happen here, look at some of the places that it's happened. And luckily there was a citizen there that was alert, uh, didn't hesitate once he realized what it was tried to stop the threat himself and luckily stop that violence. Then the, the killer, because we want to call them shooters, but these are killers, he fled. And so luckily the violence stopped or everybody in that church could have been lost, unfortunately. So that's what people need to realize is 
is not be in that denial stage to where, you know, you're trying to explain something in a way in your mind because none of us want to think that we could be in a life-threatening incident or that others' lives may be threatened. And so it goes back to it's, it's a pretty simple slogan or phrase that is easy to remember. If you see something, say something. That's what police law enforcement are here for is for people to make those phone calls and no police officer or police department's ever going to get mad about a tip that comes in and think, oh, I can't believe someone was calling in and thinking that this is something. No, if, if you think it is suspicious, call somebody, tell somebody, and let us look into it. And if it's nothing great, no harm done. Um, we did our job. But if it is something, you may have just saved some people's lives. Is there a specific profile of a person who's more likely to report something happening? Has that ever been looked into? I mean, do you get, does it, does it really span the gamut? It, it really does. There's really no profile that I know of, of, of individuals that are going to report suspicious behavior. I think the main thing is just awareness and knowledge and getting the word out there. Again, don't, don't try to explain something away that you see that if your initial gut feeling is telling you this doesn't look right, then go with that gut feeling. Mm -hmm. And, and, whether you're around a security guard, a police officer, or somebody, some type of authority figure, let them know or let somebody else know what you saw and they can keep eyes on that situation while you're reporting it. If you have to walk away from it to report it for whatever reason, then let somebody else know in your area and if time's permitting and at least tell somebody else, hey, what do you think of that? Look over there right now and get another person's perspective and see. I think your point is, is if something sounds out of place, seems out of place, looks out of place, it's probably out of place, right? But can you articulate a little bit more about, you know, as a citizen, what am I supposed to be looking out for? What are all of us supposed to be looking out for? And how can we be helpful? Let's narrow that down into two categories. Let's talk about very quickly family or friends, people that you know. So you want to look at changes in behavior. Are they acting just unsafe in their actions, a little careless for themselves, erratic, are they becoming highly aggressive for someone that really wasn't aggressive in the past? Do they talk about being mistreated and they're starting to tell you about what they would do or what they want to do that individual or that business? You know, so they got these plans of retribution. Are they starting to abuse drugs or alcohol where that's somebody that's never done that before? Are they starting to distance themselves from family and friends? So when you see those major changes, it doesn't necessarily always mean that they're on this pathway to violence. But it's a good indicator, and it's something that, that you definitely need to look into and see about getting that individual some help, especially if it's a family member or friend. If it's somebody you don't know, again, we just talk about things looking suspicious. If you do see somebody in, you know, outside at some kind of event and they're dropping a bag or something like that, like a backpack into a trash can, for example, or you know, it's not typical in Texas for someone to wear a long trench coat or a heavy coat in August – into a building, as whether it's a school, a church, something like that, suspicious behavior, because that's just not normal. Most of us are going to be in shorts and a t-shirt, right? When it's August in Texas and it's 105 degrees outside. So you just got to look at those things that look out of place. I also think there's a reluctance sometimes when you do see something, really, how far do you carry it? I guess I would ask you, what would you say to, I'm sure you meet with kids all the time because you're working in the schools. I mean, how do you say to them, it's okay, give us a call if you're not sure? I mean, do you want those kind of calls? We all kind of stop ourselves from picking up the phone sometimes when we do see something because we're like, we don't want to bother them. Yeah. Well, first of all, we definitely want people to know that we got in this job, this profession to protect people and to be, be trusted individuals, protect them, protect their property. So it's our job. If someone's perspective is different from mine, but they think something looks suspicious, then we want them to call. And if it's not, again, we're, we're getting paid. <laughs> so we might as well be doing something right. I know all of them, you can report something anonymously if you don't want your name out there. At our schools, for example, we have an anonymous app that a student or a parent or a faculty member can report something that they feel suspicious, anything. Or they can simply report they have a friend or somebody that they believe is suicidal or if it's a bullying situation. So, and again, they can remain anonymous and then we're still going to look into it and see if, if, that, if that tip is valid. So most people can rest easy if they just think about if I reported something and it turned out to be a bad situation, I'm going to feel good that I reported it. But what if I didn't and then something happened? You know, something bad happened and they had that chance to report it but just didn't want to because they're 
feeling bad about bothering the police or whatever, or even taking those few minutes to do it. Just do it. And and that's our job. Can you tell us any stories when citizens have come forward to give you tips that, you know, it has been helpful? I'll use the word helpful instead of saying, you know, yeah, they reported something. You know, there's been a lot of incidents to where... um, whether it is someone reporting about a friend that is talking about, for example, committing theft or something like that, or they think that their neighbor is being abused by their spouse. That's the type of tips we're getting in our city. Thank God we're not uh, receiving tips on situations that could be a mass casualty incident. So um, we haven't had that yet, at least. And I, you know, you pray that you never do. But we do get tips from citizens, and it does pay off, of just suspicious behavior and we're able to deploy our officers to those areas a large majority of the time, what they told us was accurate. And so it's very helpful. What outreach efforts exist for preventative measures? We're talking about reporting, but what about the other side? You know, getting kids to be aware of their behavior. Tell me what's out there. In our community, um, we try to, again, do a lot with our schools, with our school resource officers, our teachers, our counselors, just talking to our kids about what is suspicious and about really stepping up and reporting that behavior. In our neighborhoods with our community, we have neighborhood crime watches. We have a couple of officers that are dedicated to essentially a community officer, and they go out and meet with the HOAs. They meet with these neighborhood crime watch groups. We have coffee with the cop where we talk about all kinds of issues. But especially with our crime watch groups, just teaching our citizens how to get together, help them formulate a plan for a neighborhood crime watch and so that they're talking to each other and they're watching. And if they see something, they're reporting suspicious behavior. So that's one of the best ways for us to get tips and for us to be proactive is to involve the community. There is a lot more community members than there are police officers, right, in almost every community. So if we can just help make them aware but give them some good strategies and plans to help set some of these crime watch groups in place, then we're providing them with the tool as well and just awareness. And then they start to meet some of their neighbors and get to know each other. And that helps out as well. And they can look out for each other. And how often do you prepare? Do you run drills for domestic terrorism? I know some towns, they do a mass casualty situation and they do mock situations. Tell me a little bit about how Midlothian is preparing. As a city for years, we have prepared for active shooter training just on the police side. We just recently, last year, matter of fact, March, April, May, we did active shooter training with our police, fire, and dispatch all together. So it was integrated response training. So we can make sure as a city that we're all on the same page and know how to respond to that together, work together. And so that was a great thing. Because of our relationship with the city and the school district, every fall semester, we do a tabletop exercise. And then in the spring, we try to duplicate that tabletop in a full-scale event. So a tabletop exercise being where we just get a lot of people in the room, usually 100, 120 people. We give them a scenario. Uh, For example, it could be a tornado that takes out a school and some city buildings, and they work through what would you be doing? What would your initial response be to start working towards that recovery effort? And the city then can know and hear what the school district would be doing. The school district can can know and understand what resources they might have. I'm assuming the room is filled with uh, city employees. City employees and and, and, and Midlothian ISD employees. And then so they work through that together. This past fall, we went through a active shooter tabletop scenario and worked through that. And then actually um, in May, we're going to do a full scale active shooter training and simulate, unfortunately, an active shooter happening at at a Friday night football game. And so we are going to have actors in the stands. We're going to have police, fire and dispatch there, several other police agencies involved, other fire agencies, um, care flight involved, our, our hospital here involved in Midlothian. So really a full scale exercise to make sure that everybody's on the same page and just test ourselves, test our first responders, see what went well and see where we need to make improvements so we can go back and train more. And so that's something we plan on doing every year. As you look back on your career, I know you're certainly a young guy, so you have a lot of years left, but what stays with you? You know, you're in a leadership role as commander. Can you tell us any stories from your career that where you've helped people? Uh, you know, some of the most rewarding stories that, that you think back on is just, and there's a lot in this profession that you can do to influence or help people, but really specifically, you know, where people have been abused and you help, help get them out of that situation, or you have 
Is there one though that stayed with you, which you can talk about? You're certainly not naming names or just a real specific incident where you felt that, you know, you had made a difference and you left feeling good about your choice. You talked a little bit about, you know, your former profession, you ran a health club. I guess you trained police officers and I guess one day you decided I want to move into law enforcement. So I just wondered once you make that decision, you know, what, what stays with you that you did the right thing? Yeah, and definitely I, I, uh, you know, that, that kind of ate at me for a while before I made the decision. But my dad was also a cop, so I, I grew up around it. But I think there, there's been one or two situations involving kids, and I'll be a little bit more specific. But that's what that's why I was glad when this position opened up as um, commander of the school officers, because we didn't have a commander for a while or the school officers, just a sergeant. I left as the patrol commander of Midlothian and, and took this position because of some incidents with kids, you know, specifically, there was a, unfortunately some young kids that went through some abuse and it was the, uh, the mother's boyfriend that was abusing, abusing them. But unfortunately, the mother was also allowing that to happen. So the happy ending there, because that, of course, is a horrible story, is um, unfortunately, not unfortunately for the boyfriend, he ended up in jail, but also the mom and the kids were taken, taken away from her and put into foster care, but ultimately adopted. And I've been able to stay in contact with those kids. And as they've gotten older now, they actually thank us for removing them from that position when in the, in the beginning, they didn't want to be away from their mom. But now um, they've grown up to be very good kids at the end of their high school years and just to see them thriving and, and actually happy and had you know gotten away from that situation just through just really good investigation and a good team effort, we were able to you know make that arrest and get those kids separated, you know, out of, just out of that bad spot. And so those are the ones that really make you think that I know if I didn't make a difference or have never made a difference in anybody else's life in this profession, I got two kids that that I still talk to and, and still stay in contact with that that they they thank me for what I did. Yeah, that's actually one of the wonderful things about I would think about being a police officer in a smaller community. You really, you know, get to know its patterns, its people, right? All the communities within this community. I'm sure you you look at it and, and know it probably better than most. And we were to that point, and <laughs> as we continue to grow, um, we're at about thirty eight thousand population now. And I can tell you, just ten years ago, we were probably at about you know eighteen thousand or so. But we really do try to do a good job, and it helps having officers in the schools to at least continue to know the kids, and then you have an opportunity to meet their parents. And again, through some of our outreach programs within the community, as we grow, we want to try to keep that tight-knit feel Midlothian and know our citizens as best we can and just keep that relationship because that is what is going to ultimately lead them to say something if they see something because they have a trust in us and know that we will take action and any kind of tip that they give, we'll, we'll take it seriously and look into it. How do you think that this campaign that we're both involved in, you know, we produced this public service announcement for the North Texas Council of Governments and hope to share it with the citizens and really get people to respond to it. But how do you see it really having an effect on people? I hope what it does is they, they, they see it and they, they see the video and they realize that hopefully empowers them to think that I could make a difference if I say something. You never know what kind of impact you're going to have. If it's suspicious, just report it. You know, don't hold back. And then hopefully the video conveys that the officer is, is going to take action by the citizen reporting it to them. And you get kids in the video. And certainly, I don't know of anybody that doesn't want to protect their kids or, or other kids. And so that's something that I hope it just creates an awareness and gets them to realize this we call it situational awareness, just looking around, being aware of your surroundings. And again, not we don't want people to be paranoid, but be aware of what you're at, what's around you. And there's so many smart people out there that realize if something's out of place, again, just not to minimize it or think that it's nothing and just realize that let us do the job that the citizens pay us to do and tell us what you see and try to be as descriptive as you can who or what you saw. And it's really a partnership. It's saying, let's work together. Let's try to protect our community together. You know, we're paid to protect it. You know, you live here, so you want it protected. So together, let's 
let's make this happen and let's try to, you know, work. It really is collaboration in a way, isn't it? Collaboration with citizens. One of the things, we're storytellers at Cactex Media and, and really believe in the power of stories. And I hope we've done that in this, you know, showed two scenarios that really should speak out and tell people the things that we're talking about when we say, see something, say something. And it will be up on our website, which is cactexmedia.com, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to see it. But we also are really interested in telling stories. And I would ask you, what are you looking at these days in terms of streaming or movies that you've seen or books that you've written? Are there any stories that are engaging you and you'd like to tell people about? You know, I'll be, I'll be honest with you that a show came out on Netflix called Reacher. It's about a guy that used to be in the military and is out now and kind of kind of wandering around and stumbles into suspicious behavior that ends up helping a small city uh, solve, solve a whole high-profile crime that, that unfortunately his brother was involved in and he didn't even know at first. And so I'm kind of drawn uh, probably obviously to, to police-type, you know, or military-type. Uh, Isn't that unusual, shows, though? But, people usually, I, th- I always thought people who were involved in that profession don't want to see it until on, you know, on their screens, but I guess. Yeah, to a certain extent, some of them you do kind of uh, maybe laugh out a little bit and think that would never happen um, or that's not the way it happens, but then you realize it's it's Hollywood. Have, they have to glamorize it, right, and make it more exciting than right. sometimes what it is. So, But actually, um, to be honest with you, I don't, I'm not watching a whole lot of TV. I'm finishing up uh, my graduate degree right now, so I spend a lot of time uh, reading and researching, and, and uh, until that's done in, in August, I will go back to watching a little bit of TV. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.